Digital branding expert and former Unilever executive, Namrata Kamdar is also the founder of Planair, a clean skincare brand empowering young women to enjoy taking care of their skin. Planair has an incredible story and I cannot wait for you all to hear it. Hi everyone and welcome to Founder Beauty, a podcast dedicated to future entrepreneurs who thought some of the biggest brands today and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of their most intimate stories, their path to success and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Babel and Name, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable and Maine has been an incredible journey so far and I decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, and so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Namrata Kamdar. She launched Planair in 2019 from a genuine need for safe, effective, and enjoyable skincare after suffering from burnout herself. On a mission to empower young women to lead more balanced lives, Planair says it all in its beautiful name. Derived from the French expression for in the open air, Namata has created a brand that has truly advocates emotional well-being and mental health within the beauty space. A branding expert and former global brand manager for the likes of Dove, Comfort, and Lacme, Namrata is also a self-professed innovation junkie, and I love that she's spreading the message that beauty can be as much about self-discovery as it is the end result of the skincare routine. The same can be said for building a brand, and as founders, the journey is such a rewarding experience, despite all the challenges along the way. So I cannot wait to go deeper into all of this with Namrata today and learn more about Planair as well. So Namrata, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. That was very eloquent introduction well thank you thank you i do have um, an amazing uh, side for okay. Priyanka who basically helps me with all the stuff so I that's great to thank you, to you. Um, <laughs> but uh, i want to start a little bit sort of um with my i want to go into the story and the branding but i always ask the same question to all my guests so i think if you are a listener you know what's going to come who in a nutshell is namata wow i think I think in a nutshell, I'm like a free spirit. I think I probably didn't know that about myself uh, early on in my career. And I think that's why I've sort of taken the path that I have, because I felt pretty constrained by my circumstances that kind of led me to do what I'm doing. But I think I think I'm a creator. I think I, I want to create new ideas and concepts and I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. I feel like there are two kinds of people. One kind of person who feels safe in a crowd and wants to move with the crowd. And you see that all the time in the corporate world and in, in general in life. And I think that I'm in some ways the opposite of that. I kind of want to go against the crowd a little bit. And yes, I'm a free spirit and I'm like highly independent and autonomous. And I guess that is like, like a defining characteristic of who I am in a way. Amazing. I love that. I, and I think also, you know, having known you for a while, I can, I can see that that's something that you also want to like diffuse into the brand as well. So we're going to go into that as well. But um, let's start with Bailey Namrata. So can you tell us a little bit about those early young years and those memories of beauty growing up that are stick with you throughout time? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think my first beauty trope or archetype or role model is obviously like it is for a lot of people, their their mothers, you know. So my mom, yeah. I still remember when, uh, you know, I was, it was this was 1978. We lived in a small town in um, in Virginia called Falls Church. My father and mother both worked for the Indian government. They're both IS officers, but then my father... Uh, had this incredible opportunity in 1976 to move his family to Washington, D.C. So we lived uh, near Georgetown. We lived in Falls Church, Virginia. And my mom every day would drop us to school in a sari. She would, you know, wear her sari, her bindi, her beautiful pearls, um, and this big winter coat. So I was the only child being dropped off to school, like to nursery school, or to, to, you know, we went to public school uh with a mom that looked completely different, but 
you know, my mom using, you know, ponds, uh, you know, Tresor was her favorite fragrance. I still remember that. Um, I remember as a young child going through my grandmother, we'd go home and see my grandmother and going through her jewelry box. And so I think those are the first sort of memories of beauty. And I think like Indian women, especially for the time, I think 70s and 80s, it was a very natural look, you know, like coal and a fresh face and always, there was always the red lipstick. Like I remember that with my parents and I think lipstick has gone up and down and it's in style, it's not in style. But I always remember that that was like the dramatic, you know, like the red lipstick or the maroon lipstick or those typical shades that you find South Asian women wearing, but it's very beautiful and very artistic in a way. So, you know, and then as I got older, I remember, I remember when the first body shop opened in Falls Church, Virginia. And I remember going inside. And then later when I was in business school, I bought Anita Roddick's book. And I think she was like, a like very, I, I remember that. I remember thinking about, well, I'm going to study business. I'm going to, I'm going to study what it is to make a business, how to be a, like a business person. And um, I remember reading about her journey and how she started her company and how she always kind of embedded social justice within every one of her brands. So I think that was like an early, someone that I looked at as, as a role model and kind of what she was doing was very iconic for the time, the way that the store looked, the models they yeah. used, it was all very different, differentiated. Yeah. I didn't know. That's so cool. That's uh, this is why I love asking these questions because you always don't know the 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 little moments that inspire you throughout time. Um, but what I what I also wanted to find out a little bit more about was so you grew up in India. You went to Delhi University. Um, I think you studied business and economics, and then you went to Texas. You had quite a lot of experience all over. You know, US. Now you're in the UK. Tell us a little bit about sort of that, and also your kind of perception of beauty as you discovered all these different yeah, of course. areas of life. And so, yeah, yeah I, was, I was two years old when we moved uh, from mm. India in the 70s to um, Falls Church. So a very idyllic upbringing, very suburban. Um, I remember taking, you know, the, the subway to see my father on H Street in Washington, D.C., where he worked with the World Bank. It was this huge... Um, you know, uh, amazing set of people that he worked with from all over the world, because uh, he's he's an economist. That's what he he did at the time for the World Bank on infrastructure projects, and we lived there until I was eleven. And then, hmm. you know, you asked a lot about role models and 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 you asked about yeah. beauty, but who's been? I remember like my mom saying to my dad, like, so we have our children, our three kids, and you know, uh, they're now at an age where they don't need me as much. So I think I'm going to actually go back to India and I'm going to go and pursue the career that I wanted before I became a mother. So my mom left, you know, she, my grandmother came and lived with us. My mom left and um, she went back to work in India because she didn't feel like the U S was offering what she wanted for her career. She was doing this for her to pursue her career. She went back in to work for the Indian government after 11 years, I think it was. And I remember that really sticking with me as a child, like, my mom's purpose is, of course, to be a great mother and to, you know, be a wife. But her purpose is beyond that. Her purpose is to do something, to create her own niche, to be a leader. And my mom is like a very, has been a very central figure in my life, just in terms of, you know, she gave the IS exam the first, the ver on the very first go, she was, I think, in the top five people, all India. Her name was on Indian radio. And she's been in a, a you know, a, she's done some amazing things in India and now she runs um, a charity. She runs an orphanage. So she's been kind of a central force in our life, but eventually my father moved us back because of my mother's career. So that also stuck with me. It's like right now, like we compromise We're 10 years here and actually I'm going to move back because your mother is happier there pursuing her career. So we moved, all of us moved back to India and then I spent the ages of 12 to sort of, um, 21 in India, which is, was obviously very traumatic, but it's such a, it's such a good thing that they did that because I, I just don't think that I would have the same appreciation for India that I have now. Like I can speak the language. I'm very comfortable there. I can cook Indian food. I mean, there's so many little things that you pick up because that's kind of a central time. Like adolescence is a central time in your life. And I think yeah. I really, you know, understood India in a completely different way, but then I also obviously had 
this these ideals that had come from living in, in my formative years in the US. And then I went yeah. off to do my MBA. Um, I went to Austin, Texas, which was, you know, really cool. Michael Dell <laughs> graduated from UT and he, he was setting up Dell computer in his off of his living room couch or whatever. Um, the yeah. year I graduated, Enron went bankrupt. Um, Anderson Consulting went under. <laughs> it's crazy, like all of those. Um, and yeah. so then I went to work um, in Atlanta for the Coca-Cola company, which was kind of like a really cool experience. Um, uh, there are no water fountains in the in the Coke building in Atlanta. <laughs> Every morning, people came to meetings with a Diet Coke. It was, it was, it was crazy, I like how so embedded the culture is. <laughs> Um, but it was a, it was a fantastic training ground. Um, and then I decided to actually move back to India, which was again, I think looking at it in hindsight, um, I could have just stayed in the States, but you know, my husband, well, my boyfriend at the time, my husband was based in India. So I moved back to Mumbai. I got my first job at, at Unilever. Um, this is like 2004. Um, and then I worked at Unilever for five years there. Um, which was really, it was like fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. It was like going to consumers' homes, explaining the category, really understanding, obviously, you know, for Unilever, India is one of its, at the time, I mean, even probably now, it's one of their biggest businesses. And also the growth rates are huge. So worked with some amazing people uh, in Unilever in, in, in India. I had the privilege of working on the Lakme brand, which is, it's the largest, um, beauty brand in India by volume, like if you look at it, not by value, but if you look at it by volume in just in terms of number of products sold, they're the biggest in face care, lipsticks, nail polish, all of that. Um, so they were acquired obviously by Unilever, but I worked in that company. And then my husband decided to leave <laughs> India to go do his MBA. And he eventually got a job here in London. So at that point, Unilever sent me to London as an expat, which was honestly fantastic again. So I worked for another five years uh, building these global teams. I worked on the global team for laundry and fabric conditioner, and then on the Dove global team, which was amazing, like incredible, yeah. um, to have the opportunity to extend Dove into baby care, which also coincided with myself, with motherhood for me. Like basically I had a child. When I came back from maternity leave, my daughter, when I came back from maternity leave, I then worked on extending Dove into baby care, which was an awesome experience, like in terms of learning and all of the work that you have to put in to be able to commercialize a brand at that level. Um, so yeah, it's like 16 years. And then I left Unilever and I went to work in um, venture, like at a portfolio company for Unilever Ventures, which was also extremely interesting and a great early like experience in entrepreneurship, I think. It really is important, I think, as much as, we, you know, we're now we're going to talk about the brand, but it's really important to people to know the story behind before, because I think it just a, enriches it, but also it shows sometimes there is a lot of free work without realizing when we create brands that we're training ourselves for, right? I'm sure it wasn't like when you, when you entered um, all the companies you worked for in the past that you had this like clear vision of Planair, right? But it just eventually when you create it, you're like, oh, that helped me, that helped me, that helped me. And uh, sometimes we need to not know to know, if that makes sense. Um, uh, but I, I do want to talk about how Planair started. So I guess the stage is yours again. Um, what is sort of the early seeds that like, were integral in creating Planair as, as we see it today? Yeah, so I think there were so many changes. Like this is around like maybe, this is after I had my son, like in 2014, uh, 2015. Yeah. I think the beauty industry had just shifted and changed so much. There were big changes coming just in terms of digital innovation, you know, that model, that that very pushy sales model that we had seen, you know, like yeah. you launch something, you put it in a store, was moving to an engagement model. And people were leaning yeah. forward to have conversations with brands and they were fed up of being fed stories about brands or you know, they could switch off a brand, they could switch off advertising, everything was in somebody else's control, like it wasn't a one way conversation anymore. And around the time that I had been working on um, sort of baby care, and then eventually I did some work on face care as well. I was just seeing 
you know, like a lot of noise on the internet. This is like on moms that, you know, mothers discussing like in pregnancy, what's the right thing to eat? What's the right thing to, you know, this is around the time like pre goop, like people in their thirties and forties were talking about ingredients in a completely different way. Um, you know, Unilever had acquired a number of businesses that had a different approach to ingredients myself when I was looking at clinicals across um, skincare, face care, some of the work we did on hair care, we were being very specific about what materials we were choosing to use. We obviously didn't want to indict the rest of Unilever's portfolio, but at the same time, there was definitely an obligation just based off of what we were seeing online of people becoming much more, because of digital transparency, people becoming much more aware of what was going into their bodies. Um, obviously rates of cancer and things like there was just more digital transparency around ingredients. People were like reading inkies themselves. So I could see that that was one big piece. Like consumers were becoming really um, aware and formed. They weren't just taking things at face value. I think yeah. um, a younger customer was definitely driving the conversation. Um, at that point it was millennials. Now it's obviously Gen Z. Like it was, then it was Gen Z and now it's obviously Gen Alpha. I think they're approaching categories like beauty, music, technology, retail in a, such a different way. Um, they have a very investigative approach. Um, they also have, I think, as as the generations, have, I mean, I'm Gen X, you know, the so-called lost generation between boomers and millennials. But there's like there was this sense when we talked to young women and men of this this ideology or this this you know meeting these more idealistic goals around sustainability, environmentalism, slow beauty, anti-fast fashion, um, alongside digital transparency. So I was given this book by the, it was the chairman of Havas. I went to one of these meetings where the chairman of Havas spoke and he wrote this book, Who Cares Wins? And I read that book cover to cover. It was all about like how, you know, social purpose is a business goal. So if you look at companies that, uh, and you track their shareholder value of companies that embed social purpose at the heart of their business. It's not just about doing good. Social purpose truly builds loyalty, deeper consumer connections, and builds shareholder value for brands over time. So I could see there were so many different shifts happening in terms of transparency, you know, this new idealistic customer, um, less dependence on big companies creating things and pushing them out there to big retailers, a more bespoke approach around, you know, what people like. Also the innovation cycles, being able to like get feedback from a customer, put it into a product, create small batches of the product, test it and relearn, you know, like a lean UX way of creating things rather than the whole 52 week lead time and all, you know, the board, board decisions being involved in what you make, which is the traditional, like if you look at consumer products, the traditional approach is to do lots of research for years and years and years, come up with some kind of molecule. And then, you know, all that was turning over on its head. And honestly, I, I think that the big companies are really struggling with that, like because of the fragmentation and because there've been so many successful independent brands. I mean, your brand is a great example of one. I think it's really hard. So all of these shifts were going on. And that's, I think kind of, that was the reason that I felt that there could be a business opportunity there based on everything I was reading, seeing, and doing. And so obviously that's the right brain and, and rational reason for why plein air happened. But I think at a much more deeper level, I as a human being was, yeah. I was really struggling, you know? Um, and I don't know if you can, you can empathize, Akash, but do you find like with the upbringing that you've had, like coming from a South Asian background or a South Asian family, like, pressure to conform in certain ways have you ever felt that i feel like you know i'm being very fortunate my, my parents perhaps not but the society yes that makes sense so yeah and unfortunately the parents do take weight on society so i felt very mm. lucky to be in such a um i think when you have an entrepreneurial family like my dad was in beauty for 40 years you know he yeah. had to deal with the beauty talk 20 years 30 years before me so imagine at that time when um, an Indian man is entering the beauty industry. He had to, you know, he already faced adversities and thoughts and thinking when you're not the, t the status engineer, lawyer, you know. And um, 
I think naturally, obviously, it's easier for me to enter beauty and, and do my own thing because he did it. Uh, but even then, you know, there were still some fragments of this person saying this and that person saying this and this will be easier and you should just have, you know, do what you did. And maybe subconsciously I've done stuff because of that. You know, like I studied engineering for four years. I've always told myself, and I still do, that I love math, I love physics, and this is why I did it. But subconsciously in school, it was always understood you know, choose certain subjects because they're better. Do a course in this because it's going to make you more successful, probably, you know, if you don't know what you want to do in life. And I think that's the, the, the problem I think many kids face nowadays when you have the societal kind of conformities. What do you think on that? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so that was really like, for me, kind of not a crisis moment, but kind of, I remember like on my 39th birthday, like this is, you know, I just mm. given, I, was pregnant at 37 with my second child. You know, I had, I'd had, you know, you know, I'm very fortunate to have an amazing husband who is such a great support to me. He's a fantastic dad. He's, you know, my best friend. We never run short of things to say to each other. This is after 23 years of being married. Like I'm 46. We've been together for like more than half of our lives. So I'm very fortunate in that aspect. I had a lot of support at home, um, but I had gotten married at the right time, had my kids at the right time, had the career at the right time, blah, 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 did all the ticking the boxes. And then as I approached 39 ish, that's when it kind of all just went a bit crazy. Like I, I just remember feeling so depressed, so unfulfilled, so unhappy, but I could, I could see that it was me splitting from my old self. Like now when I look back on it, I can see that that was when I split from who I thought I was to who I'm now and who I'm going to be. And it was very yeah. painful at the time. Uh, but I'm afterwards, I felt like I had been freed from a jail and I could breathe and I could just be who I was. What happened was I just, I, I felt that who I was as an individual would not be accepted by where I was at the time. So I was expected to act a certain way, behave a certain way, do certain things. And that wasn't making me happy. Mm. And it wasn't who I was. It wasn't being true to, you know, I do, I want to, you know, get the corner office and be on the board and wear this certain look and, and conform to things and only come up with ideas that are just about acceptable to somebody in a, in a very sort of boxed in. If I felt very boxed in, I felt like being in this career was like being in a lukewarm bath. I wasn't able to create something fresh and something new. And I would, have these ideas and these visions, but then I'd explain it to someone and they would look at me like, like I was crazy or like that would be so risky and then get me the data to support it. And I just felt trapped, you know, but I think I kept thinking that I have to try harder. I have to try harder to make these ideas and myself be accepted even more. I want to try, I want to try more and more and more to be accepted, you know, like to get to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And the more I did that, the more anxious I got, the more unwell I felt. And then one day, I literally, I remember the day so clearly. I went to work just as I normally do every day. And I just, I literally got there and I saw like my desk and everyone. That, and it was like in a movie, like I just, everything became exaggerated and I just couldn't breathe. I didn't, I went into the conference room and I remember, and there was, like the top, like the top, top, like head of the business. Um, I had a very close relationship with like, basically what I guess you call the dub, the, the senior leadership team, a very close relationship with the PA there. And I remember just saying to her, like, I need to leave. She's like, what do you mean you need to leave? She's, I was like, I can't stay here anymore. Like I physically cannot stay here. I have to go. And I went into a conference room and she brought me some water. And I said, this is my last day in the business. This is after just what, 17 wow. years. And I just walked out the door That's... and I put my pass in the thing and I went to occupational health and I said, I'm signing myself off. I don't think I can do this anymore. I was like crying every night. Good and um, wow. I remember my friend who's now my dear, dear friend, Hajar, she was, she's now chairman of the Unilever business in Sri Lanka, uh, incredibly accomplished uh, person. We started in the business together and she was standing outside um, and she was like, where are you going? And I was like, I'm, I'm done. She's like, what do you mean you're done? <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm done. And that was, oh gosh, my last day at work. And, um, I just took a whole year off. I took a year off 
you know, you know, you know, leave a credit to them. Like in terms of healthcare, I had the best healthcare. Um, I couldn't really make, I, I was at a point that I was so anxious about my career and what I was doing and whether it was right or wrong that I couldn't make basic decisions for my family. And I just wasn't well. And so I took a whole year off and I did yoga and I introspected and I, um, I would go to the Priory, which is, um, you know, it's, it's a, um, a mental health facility and they, what they specialize, they specialize in two things, addiction and stress related burnout. And I was on this program where all the same group of people would come together on Tuesday and Thursday, and we would all sit together. And it was people from completely different walks of life. Some people were, you know, had attempted suicide, had taken, you know, tried to take their own life, had been, you know, like lifelong bipolar, all, you know, and it was just, I have to say, I just learned so much about mental health and how to stay well, you know, how mm. nobody gives you a map to navigate stressful situations no. at work. But what I learned or work life relation relationships, a lot of it was about boundaries and negotiating relationships with people. So yeah. one of the one one this is the last thing I'll say, we can move on. But one day there was this lady who came in and did tarot cards and she said you know today we're going to do vision boarding and you're going to write this vision of okay you had your life before you had a mental might have had whatever mental health crisis or in some people's cases you know attempted self-harm or attempted thing whatever it might be and now you're in therapy and recovery and we want to talk about a broad view of your life after this event or this awakening or whatever you had what's going to happen different how are you how are you going to change and make your behaviors different to stay well and manage your anxiety and manage your relationships after this and she gave everybody tarot cards and i still have the tarot card she gave me um and that day we, we talked about how about taking responsibility for staying well and having good mental health and what that means as a contract to yourself and it was just after that p- period of a year, I like actually went back into work. I went to work, as I said, I worked in Finland for Unilever Ventures. I went um, yeah. to go be at a small company called Lumine. It was 60, 70 million in turnover. I was their head of digital and head of innovation. And then ultimately also doing most of their digital marketing uh, roles for them uh, until I, I hired a, yeah. a couple of people to, to do all of their digital stuff before I left. But um, yeah. In any situation, you know, you're going to come across these same issues, anxiety, managing, negotiating relationships and boundaries in any relationship. So I think what I learned there is like foundationally important in keeping good mental health habits, having good boundaries, making sure you're not overworking, overstressing, just because of the way that I was raised and the way that I saw my own parents, they're quite driven. But also, yeah. you know, we lead different lives today. We can never really switch stuff off the way it used to be. So I think it's really great. I learned some really important tactics. And it was at that time that I was really thinking about creating my own business. But it was really the lessons that I learned in my own process of staying well mentally that led me to create this brand and right. also bake in those principles for you know, younger users who are always receiving these messages, these barrage of messages, you're not this enough, you're not that enough, you're not blank enough, you're not thin enough, you're not rich enough, you're not this enough. And that was kind of the, I wanted to just take all those messages and make it completely, turn it on its head and tell everybody that not, it's not about self-acceptance, it's about being emotionally well and the process of beauty, getting to know yourself and valuing what you have and making the process of looking after yourself as pleasurable and as beautiful as possible. I love that. No, it's really important messages. And, and thank you for being so open and vulnerable with us. Cause I think it's important that, um, people, uh, kind of normalize, you know, conversational, um, stories like this, because it's, it's important to know we're not alone. I can tell you from my experience in corporate world, uh, it's very similar, but you sometimes think very singularly. You think that, 
oh, is it me? Is it is it something I is it my problem? Am I the issue? But actually, sometimes it's 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 nothing you can control. The only thing you can control is what you do with yourself after. And it's like, do I leave this situation? Do I leave this energies and focus on something new? And it's not easy, especially after what seventeen years yeah. um, in that company, and then taking a decision. And sometimes it's a gut, and sometimes you haven't. You don't need to spend too long to to think about it. You just know, and when you know, you you want to make a decision. And I think the biggest, the next, you know. I think the biggest thing that I can take out from what you just said is that you've just demonstrated to me, exa- like in, in what you just said right now, it's about taking back control in some senses and making yeah. those decisions. You know, it's like the person who complains about the abusive boyfriend or the abusive spouse or the abusive, but you have a choice every day. You have a choice to stay and have people disrespect you or not treat you in a kind way, or you have the choice to leave. So it's, it's always, I think for me, that sort of victim narrative like why is this happening to me why am i not getting where i'm supposed to be why do people and actually saying well actually baby this is all part of the process of growth and actually if something bad happens no matter what it is you lose a relationship you lose you know uh money you lose a business venture i think at that moment in time it's very hard or you, you leave a company because you're not getting to where you expect to go you shouldn't ask yourself well why is this happening to me i'm so unlucky you should be asking the question to ask at that point in time is, where am I going? Because there's, mm. there's a reason that that's happened. Yeah. And you have to trust you're on a path to get to the next thing that will bring you happiness, that will bring you joy. But staying in a bad situation, what you just said, is not the answer. Yeah. It's growing. to It's, it's saying no answer, and yeah. that growth that comes uh, from it. And it's, I know it's really hard sometimes to, uh, to, to leave situations. There's a lot more in play. There's a lot more, you know, whether you're in the, in the company, you have a financial obligation you need to stay in, even though you can't, you know, take the risk to leave. And in a relationship, it's hard sometimes. But I think um, the more we normalize conversations around it, the more we'll have a surround, like a supporting system that will help you as well to make you feel not alone in those decisions. I think that's one of my main things as well, I feel is important is it gets more nerve scary for people to take decisions because they feel alone in that right and they don't feel uh, and also that judgment like you said coming back like judgment exactly that's what i would tell my 14 year old self is that don't maybe and that's what i tell my daughter like don't just follow the crowd don't worry so much about what people think if you're going to be so stressed out by whether you're liked and what people think you'll never be true to yourself so in a sense for the first 20 years i was like so worried about finding approval from people in senior positions at work or being accepted or whatever that I kind of lost who I was and I decided I'm going to stand up for who I am and I have great ideas I have a bigger vision and I was kind of almost constrained by it and I'm going to go after what I want to do rather than worrying about pleasing people or what other people think like what society thinks right like all of those things that you hear like judgment from other people that's really that's beautiful. Oh, I, I, now I think it's perfect segue to talk about um, the products because the mission is so clear and the why, but you have incredible products that deserve its time as well. So tell us a bit about the current range that people can find today and where to find it as well. Yeah, I mean, so I think the number one place to find it is plenair.co. Um, though we have good relationships with uh, retailers, we're available at places like Skins Cosmetics, uh, which is out in um, Amsterdam. We're available at Space and K, of course, uh, Credo. So we're available in smaller stores. We haven't made the shift yet to really big retail stores, but we're available in more boutique and independent retailers, as well as on our own website. Um, I think, you know, with the way that things have shifted in, in online, um, it's more expensive than ever to acquire customers online. You know, I think we went through a phase between 2014 and 2019-ish where, and then obviously COVID happened, which kind of had this big effect on what was already, I think, a growing space. And it forced a lot more people to go online. So it's just much more competitive. It's much more saturated online. You know, um, iOS 14, all of the uh, GDPR regulations, things have become more and more complicated with digital acquisition of of customers. So I think as much as people want to build an online D2C unicorn, like it's harder and harder to do. 
And I don't think that kind of thing exists anymore either. I think everything is online, everything is digital, and it's become kind of a right to play rather than being something out of the ordinary. Um, but you have to have both. You have to have the ecosystem online of loyalty and, and being able to be present online, you know, with, with social and, and, and editorial and, and content and all of that. Especially for somebody, you know, like our, our company is focusing on, you know, age group, you know, when you first buy your first serious skincare brand, like, um, you know, you would see girls at different phases. And we did a lot of research. We did ethnographies. We went out and spoke to girls at, at every different, you know, between the ages of 9 and 11, 11 and 16, 16 and 21. You know, we, we wanted to create a premium boutique brand. So we were not really focusing on girls under the age of 16 because, it, it felt like the parent was the gatekeeper. It was it was a different feeling. I also had some you know ethical considerations with that in terms of do I really want to be marketing to somebody who's at a very very young age? I prefer to market to her mother and then her eventually after the age of seventeen. So I think our primary target audience is people, you know, women in their forties and fifties that have children under the age of sixteen, eleven to sixteen, and then also girls after the age of seventeen that are ready to buy their first nice skincare brand, you know, like for a serious skincare brand. So um, we were very keen to not create products, textures, sensories that already existed. I didn't want the anonymous company fragrance smell, like it looks like everything, feels like everything else, looks like everything else. We wanted to create really interesting textures and, ide and ideas. We wanted multitasking to be at the heart of every product. This came, by the way, from our customers. They were all talking about, you know, one and done. They didn't want to be pressured to buy lots of different products. So Violet Pace, Skin Frosting, Tripler Mask, they're all standalone hero platforms. Like a Tripler, I'm sure you could find a similar product with that's, you know, a mask and then emulsifies into a wash and is clay and has an exfoliant but it won't look, feel, or smell like ours with pink clay, with black currencies. We wanted to create very, you know, these these product platforms that had their own personality and character. Same with the skin frosting idea that came from, you know, it's just tossing ideas back and forth with my chemist and like saying, okay, well, what if we had a moisturizer and a plumper and a mask and lots of things all in one to create a product approach that felt a little bit different. And I think that's really resonated. I think people like products to have a personality, you know, the naming, the ingredients, the story, how you use it, you know, skin frosting as a franchise can extend into hair frosting and body frosting and lip frosting. And there's so many different ways that you can extend that franchise when the time is right. But, mm -hmm. you know, we really wanted to create products that had cultural and emotional resonance because there's so many products out there. And nobody needs new products. But when you find one great product like rose jelly, I remember very early on, you know, people were always like, oh, we just love the rose jelly. We love the rose jelly. I was trying to get to like, what is it in the rose jelly that's so amazing? And people were like, well, one girl was like, oh, it reminds me of Turkish delight. And another person was like, well, it's just, you know, the scent is so pleasing, you know, the idea of the sugar and the rose water, it's all very pleasing. So I think there's something in sensory pleasure also that we looked at. And also one of the biggest things that we found in the research that we did was if we're wanting to connect beauty and emotional well-being, a lot of the people that we were talking to were like, when I take off my makeup, it's like, oh, it's one of the worst things. And there was this girl in the UK and she was like, I always put on like some weird reality TV and I sit with my wipes and I have to do it. And we were like, well, actually, if you look forward to look, taking off your makeup, if you had a beautiful, pleasurable texture and a sensory that felt nice, a ritual, a lovely flannel, wouldn't you look forward to it? And that's a way to look after yourself and do it correctly. And I think that's kind of the foundation of all of our products. It's about embedding that sensory pleasure. It's about taking time for yourself. It's about enjoying the process. And the products have their own personalities and their own way of communicating that makes them memorable and easy to find. Like It's like a like lighthouse brand. Like It's something that you, you go to the next door for. You don't just give up if you can't find it you you want to go and find it somewhere else it's not in the first right. store <laughs> right. thanks for sharing that and, and what's sort of the the future on the horizon for Panair? because you mentioned a few things that could be you know on the horizon like other categories and i i think that idea of body frosting and hair frosting could be amazing but uh yeah, yeah what is sort of on the horizon for you i mean i think to be honest with you we we're really proud of the range that we have um, I, I have to say, I do admire 
mono ingredient, mono platform brands like Fitness Daughter or Eve Loam. I remember very early on, we had somebody who worked for us um, in our operations and he had worked with the founder of Eve Loam for a long time. And he was like, to be honest with you, one of the reasons it was acquired, it was such an efficient business. Also going back to the Dove business is like the Dove bar is still like the cash cow. It's like the biggest part of their portfolio, just the bar business. Um, with Eve Loam or like a Liz Earl, that cleanse and polish or that Eve Loam cleanser is still the bread and butter. It's still fifth, over half of their business. And yes, they make some money off innovating, but you know, innovation is highly capital intensive. That So I always knew in the back of my mind, Akash, that I didn't want to build a fast fashion brand. I wanted to build like a slow beauty brand. It's not just built on noise and innovation. It's like these classic beauty staples that you come back to again and again, like with rose jelly, for example, people love that product. It's a hero product. It's a big portion of our forecast. What can we do with rose jelly that will make it rose jelly 2.0, 3.0, 4.0? Like we're looking at vegan collagen now from biodesign in California to put back into the rose jelly so that there's a new edition of rose. Like it has to be timeless. These are classic products that, you know, like a Chanel red lipstick or, whatever it might be that is your classic go-to staple. So as, as much as, you know, I feel tempted sometimes to launch lots of products, I also go back to my days as a you know brand manager and then as a brand director with these little bits of business, like little tiny, tiny, tiny bits of business chasing small products and then having to go in and clean that up from a supply chain perspective. We just want to stay, keep innovating on our core keep creating classic products that people need that have integrity behind them, improving the current versions of what we have and putting out like we've just launched a serum. Actually today we've just launched a serum. So it's a good, good time time to shout it out. Um, A serum called Aesthetique. Yeah. And it's, um, it is something we've been working on for three years. It's a triple glycolic. It has beautiful ingredients, African marula, tropical passion flower. It's a beautiful texture, completely free of silicones. You know, not to talk about our competitors, but similar glycolic serums that contain dimethicone as their second ingredient sell for hundreds of dollars upwards. We're pricing ours at 39. It has a beautiful texture and sensory. So, you know, the future is, I think you just have to be true to who you are and to your customer and keep making amazing products and try and not get distracted by what your competition is doing. But yeah, we want to eventually go, I think in the future, we could go into hair care or body care or face care or do collaborations with amazing brands. You know, Um, there's nothing to stop us doing that. But I think fundamentally, this idea of plein air, which is around emotional health, well-being, thinking in an open way about beauty is kind of timeless. And so we want to keep embedding that idea and and hopefully from an investment standpoint i think that makes us a much more efficient brand to back and a much more efficient company um operationally than our competitors 100 and and, well congratulations on the new launch i'm just uh i'm on the website now so i'm going to be purchasing mine straight after i'm so excited that's uh, so exciting to to know that um something that you worked on for so long when it comes out it's just like you know it's like the birth of a baby. It's really exciting. Um, it but is, did you, yeah. um, do you, do you, do you ever get the same question? Like, do you get the same like nerves for launching a new product? Cause you know, people think, say, does it get easier? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think it gets easier. <laughs> no. <laughs> how it's perform, you know? Yeah. Yeah I, yeah. I think, I think that's again, comes back to the whole, whole thing around worrying what, people think and like the big company approach like you said you were is testing everything and testing and making sure everybody likes it and i think one of the biggest lessons i've learned um you know is if you launch something that everyone likes and no one hates it you know it's like vanilla it's like anything else it's like mm. But you have to kind of be, I think you have to kind of push yourself to be a little bit quirky, be a little bit. And I think the time has gone where consumers just accept anything from a big company and they take it at face value and they buy it. They really like this idea of personality and ideology and people's personalities coming through in, in, you know, in, in products. And I think there's a real opportunity to do that. I think, you know, like with Fable and Maine, I think 
you know, you're elevating hair care from, you know, like, hey, just wash your hair, you know, whatever it's to keep it clean, it's to keep it or like a, a cosmetic benefit alone to something which is, again, very ritualistic. It's about you. Um, it's bringing in things from history. Um, it's making it's raising awareness in a completely different way about the hair care category. So it's your lens. It's a different lens on a category that's been going for such a long time. And I think people that really resonates with people. So so I think it's it's in some ways it's a really good time in consumer you know we have the opportunity to have so many different options as a customer and be able to buy from so many different different brands and you know different people from different diverse backgrounds coming in and talking about it's not just one person you know the typical makeup of a board in these publicly listed companies is such as one way of doing things there's so many different ways so i think giving license to that is is great every way has its pros and cons so like i think if we just kind of take out i always say take out this pressure of did i make the right decision there's never a right there is whatever feels right in that moment but it could also you know it doesn't matter it's just about feeling good in your decisions and then going on to the next one and the next one and not overthinking it because if I, I i don't know about you but like as a founder i feel if i question too much my decisions i'll never sleep at night because there's hundreds of decisions every day every minute just to keep on making so the only way to stay sane as you grow and scale is just have confidence and whatever i decide in my heart in my gut is what i was meant to do and if it didn't turn out great that's okay i've learned something right it's not meant to be my um something to 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 dwell on it's something to to actually celebrate because it's a moment to grow and it's a moment to, as you said, growth, and it's a moment to, to accept it's life, right? This is and I think, I think you have to trust, perfect. you have to trust your instinct, you know, your instinct yeah. is what makes the product special and interesting. And, and we're living in a time where people want to buy into people. They're not wanting to buy into anonymous yeah. formulations. They want to buy into your yeah. brand, your charitable mission, your ideology, you know, whatever, whatever that is. And that that's, that's in- incredible that we live in such a time where we have that privilege. And we can do that. It's so true. Well, so now we're going to wrap up and go into fire round questions. Um, and, uh, but before that, I do have a question, which is, um, imagine you can, you probably know what's coming desert Island situation. So you're invited to a founded beauty retreat, but you can only take one Glenair product with you. What is that go to you're going to be bringing with you? So is it winter or summer? How about uh, middle? Like it's like like London weather right now. It's like should be summer, but it's like slightly breezy and cool. Well, it's so hard to choose, as you would know. It's like choosing between your children. But I, I think my favorite, one I of my know. favorite products right now is um, Plein Air Skin Frosting. I think as I'm getting older, you know, it's just the most amazing texture. Uh, makeup artist taught me a little trick. He's like, oh, you, do you use it? You use it at night as a mask and you wipe it away with a flannel. Well, I use it on my models on the runway. Like I use it as a makeup base. So he's actually putting it on models just before the, he does their makeup, you know? So I think it's, I, I love the idea that you have, it's like a little black dress. You dress it up, dress it down. Like I like products that are efficient and you can use them in different ways yeah. and come up with different ways of using them. So that would, I would say that that's my favorite one. Like that. Oh, very <laughs> good. And um, so now five round questions. This is the first thing that comes to your mind. So the first question is what's another beauty brand that you're currently loving right now? I love Say Beauty. <laughs> I like their formulations. And yeah. yeah. I, I, I just, uh, there's, uh, and, uh, the other thing I, I just love about them is that they're so efficient. It's a capsule collection, beautifully yeah. made, their products work. You know, they're not making a sing and dance about just, they're just they do what they say on the tin. And, and sadly, they're, they're not available here. But I, I really like the uh, say. Yeah, but they're, they're available in cult. Beauty. So Are they? A, OK, yeah. good tip. Yep. Good uh, tip. So that's a little tip there because uh, Lainey came for her, uh, her cult beauty launch. So, uh, yeah, they came for that. So. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I really I really like I, I love the brand. Yeah. And I think you guys should do a collab. You guys have like synergetic colors and that's and, true. And, uh, yeah, you're right. We're very yeah, um, uh, complementary, I guess. 
Very complimentary. I love it. Um, my next question is what um, sort of like a guilty pleasure of yours? You had one. A guilty pleasure of mine would be having the space and time to cook a meal from scratch. So that means planning it, going and buying the ingredients. If I'm making a cake, it's like, what is the best? Like, what's the most bougie chocolate I can find? What are the most bougie fruits? And like, really taking my time to find those ingredients and maybe cooking it with my daughter and putting it all together. And I don't know, inviting someone over, making you know, a beautiful table, just little things like little to and having the time and space to do that. Because I think with COVID, like we lost it, like this whole personal interaction, having a dinner party, like I bought Alison Roman's book recently. I don't know if you follow Alison Roman, but it's called Nothing Fancy. And it's all about this like cool aesthetic where it's like you just throw stuff together and it's nothing fancy, but at the same time, it's unusual. So I like this. Yeah um having the time and space to do that that's a luxury oh, that's amazing. and my last question is if you weren't a beauty entrepreneur what would namrata be doing right now so i've thought about this question quite a lot because i think you know i love the work that i do with plein air and it's it's very creative it gives me license to honestly combine motherhood with work because it, it's very hard as you get more senior in your career to combine family time, well-being time, time for yourself, um, you know, have aging parents, time for your parents to look after them and a huge career. So I feel, you know, very grateful that I have plenary. It allows me to combine so many things, stay present and be happy as a human being. That's the most important thing to me. That's the promise that I made to myself when I was 39. Um, but I think I would do something in the space of philanthropy. Um, I recently joined the board of the Anna Freud Foundation and they're doing just incredible work. Obviously, um, you know, uh, Her Royal Highness, uh, the Princess of Wales, she's the main patron. Um, They do a lot of work with early years and trauma in children. They do amazing research with, you know, the likes of Yale, UCL, it's an incredible organization with such a storied history, a rich history. Um, our new launch, Aesthetic, is in partnership with Anna Freud as well. So we are giving uh, a set of proceeds from uh, Aesthetic sales because this is, Aesthetic is all about hope. The tagline for Aesthetic is it will be more beautiful yeah. than you could ever imagine. So it's this idea that you'll wake up to even more beautiful skin or a more beautiful future. It's kind of open. Um, so this 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 whole space of mental health philanthropy well-being for children is something that i feel very passionately about my mother as you know is all like i talked about is already has been involved in that from a career perspective yeah. um she worked in, on different issues with related to women's issues in india and now she has her foundation which is mm-hmm. you know looks after uh, orphans so i think you know i think something that enables me to give my time to those kinds of things in, in a really tangible way where I can look into like without like look into governance or marketing or really use my skills and what I've learned to give back in some meaningful way is is I think what I would be doing if I wasn't doing this or maybe it will be what I'm doing as I go forward in my career because it's something that gives me a lot of personal motivation whether it's you know around education philanthropy and working with younger people you know that have been through trauma or survived trauma that's something that i find um very fulfilling that's i I always ask that question because i think it's good to remind ourselves and it's great that you've been thinking about that too so um kudos to everything you're doing and just so excited to see the future for plein air and and yourself and obviously we'll, we'll be in touch but for everyone listening how can they continue to follow you and the brand yeah, well, you can find me on Instagram. I'm not as like regular as I used to be as far as Instagram is concerned. But you know, I have a, I have a loyal, fo- small and loyal fo- following there. So I'm at Namrata K on Instagram, LinkedIn, Namrata Nayar Kamdar. I do a lot of LinkedIn now. I feel like it, it's, it, you know, I, I'm doing a lot more on that on that um, channel than I ever used to. Um, and yeah, just yeah, just DM me, drop me a DM or get in touch with me on LinkedIn. 
Um, and don't forget to follow Plenaire on Instagram and on LinkedIn too. I'll put all the links in the summary so people can just tap straight away. And uh, Great. Namata, I'll see you very soon in person. We'll just do a coffee or something because it's just around the corner. Uh, I'd but love till to. then, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and all your wise words. Really appreciate well, it. Thank you so much for inviting me and taking the time to listen. <laughs>